Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diane Bystrom, and I'm the director of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics here at Iowa State University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to the Iowa Caucus Education Workshop. Uh, we're thankful for the great group of speakers who have committed their time to Iowa State University today to explain why the Iowa caucuses matter and are important, and also to explain the processes followed by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, in the caucuses. After our three speakers, party representatives will lead us in a mock caucus and we'll be dividing the side of the room into a Republican and Democratic side. You don't have to be registered currently to vote as a Republican or Democrat. You might think about what caucus that you're likely to participate in on February 1st. And also any of you in the room that aren't registered to vote or consider yourself independents, we do encourage you to uh, join one of the caucus sites for a mock caucus. Uh, in addition to the Iowa Caucus Workshop, we have caucus-related activities taking place right next door in the South Ballroom. And so we are hoping that, as part of this process, that you'll drop by to see the State Historical Society of Iowa's first-in-the-nation Iowa Caucus Traveling Exhibit, as well as watch an excerpt of a documentary on the Iowa Caucuses um, that has been produced by Iowa Public Television. And I feel like someone's waving at me back there, but maybe not. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. Yes, my voter registration people are back there. My very next sentence, in addition, the League of Women Voters of Ames and Story County is hosting a voter registration table as part of our resource fair, and they could be located near the door there. All Iowa State, uh, and all, also Iowa State students representing a variety of political organizations, including those formed to support Democratic and Republican presidential candidates, are hosting tables as well. So I hope as part of this uh, day's event that you uh, drop by our resource fair, which will be open until 6 o'clock, uh, to register to vote. If you're not currently registered to vote in Ames, we encourage you to do so because it's looking pretty good that the caucuses will be on February 1st and our students will be in Ames and not home enjoying their winter break as in previous years. So that we hope that you will register here to vote. Uh, we also hope that you'll go through and gather information on Iowa State political organizations as well as many of the uh, 2016 Republican candidates who are represented today and all three of the Democratic presidential candidates who are represented here today. And again, that resource fair will be open until 6 o'clock. Before I introduce our first speaker, I also would like to take uh, the opportunity to thank the co-sponsors of today's event. And we have people not only from Iowa State but also the Ames community. So in alphabetical order, the Ames Chamber of Commerce, the Andrew Goodman Foundation Ambassadors, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, the Iowa State Daily, the League of Women Voters of Ames and Story County, the Department of Political Science, the Speech Communication Program, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by student government. Now, again, before I introduce our sport first speaker, I also want to tell you that I know some of you are getting extra credit to attend today. I think that's great. I think that's what we as faculty should be doing to encourage our students to attend these important events. You, uh, we have the swipe card system in place. You go to the main desk by the Great Hall, and you can swipe your card after the lecture, and that will record your class attendance. So, All right, now for our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is WHO-TV's political director, Dave Price. Dave also hosts the channel's Sunday morning show, The Insiders, and anchors the Channel 13 News on weekend evenings. As a local television reporter in Iowa for the past 14 years, Dave has probably spent more time than anyone in the United States covering presidential candidates, partially because of our unique situation in Iowa and the fact that Dave is one heck of a political reporter. He also is the author of Caucus Chaos, an insider's account of the always unpredictable ways Iowans help pick the next president. His books, by the way, are on sale, and they're great books. They're funny, and they're very informative. And so he has them for a university price of $10. Look, I'm shilling his books today, but I'm happy to do so. I enjoyed reading Iowa, his Caucus uh, Chaos, and he will be around after uh, the presentation today to sign copies. So again, please join me in welcoming mean Dave Price. Hello. Hey, I thought maybe as we'd start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the caucuses and kind of my experiences with them in that, um, in that I did not grow up in this state. So even though I've, co I've covered the caucuses since I've moved here in 01, so 04 was my first one, I have never actually caucused. So I just try to pretend like I know what they are. Um, how many people in here have ever caucused before? Uh, how many plan to next year? Interesting. For those of you who've taken part, uh, I'm curious how you would describe them, because they're kind of weird. 
you know, very unusual, very unique, which is why they scare the crap out of some people. And I think it, I think they can be very intimidating. Um, it's just not a normal thing, you know, like a, like a primary, for example, or just a regular vote. You know, you can do it by mail. It can take you what thirty seconds at your house. You mail it in, and it's done. A caucus is a is a lot bigger commitment. Best case scenario, it probably cost you an hour of your time, maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours, maybe a little bit longer. And from what I understand, you're going to walk through kind of how the caucuses work, and the Republicans have their way, and the Democrats have their way. So I won't spoil the surprise there, but clearly there's a little bit more of an investment, and that can be a turnoff for some people. But they really are a fascinating piece of our country. And frankly, they're the only way that a state like this with 3.1 million people can get the kind of influence it wants with these presidential candidates. Uh, if it were not for the caucuses and if it were not for this, this state going first, mm -hmm. there's no way these presidential candidates would spend the time here that they do. If you just look at what's happening this week, so on Saturday we'll have all three of the Democratic candidates coming to Des Moines for a nationally televised debate on Saturday night. They wouldn't be here if Iowa wasn't first. Two weekends ago, we had 10 Republican candidates all at the state fairgrounds in Des Moines. Same deal. We would not have any of these people here at the same time. Um, I wanted to mention one thing that happened today because it's my alma mater, but for those of you who are following what's happening at the University of Missouri today, that's where I went to grad school. And I think that is a microcosm of the unpredictability of politics, but it's also part of the environment we have right now. So if you're not familiar with it, they had some racist incidents on campus there that have happened over the last three or four um, months in particular. And there are certain groups there on campus, both students and outside, who are really, really, really unhappy with the system's president for not doing more on this. And he looked very slow, very did not react nearly quickly enough in showing enough energy and commitment to going after and solving what these problems were. And in the end, this morning, he quit. He resigned under pressure. Now, whether he really quit or he was told to quit, we, we may not know that. But I think it taps into, at least in, um, I'm not old enough to remember all the Vietnam stuff, so I wasn't a part of all that because I wasn't alive then. But uh, a few of you maybe remember those. But to me, Stefan says he was here. You're really that old? <laughs> Just barely. Um, there is this. It seems like there are there's kind of this anger and unhappiness right now. Um, the whole this the Black Lives Matter group became part of this University of Missouri protest, which is something that we've just seen this kind of formed movement here recently. It seems like that's one force out here. I, to me, there are a couple other forces that are maybe more economic based. You know, if you look at um, anybody in here interested from Bernie Sanders. Um, he tends to have some appeal with the, with, the, with the younger crowd. At least he does at that back table. <laughs> but he has tapped into a way where people are just mad. They're mad that they're not making enough money. They're mad there aren't enough jobs out there. They're mad that the gap keeps growing between the rich and everybody else. And he's tapped into that. And if you go to his events, he's bringing some new people into this, into this mix. And on the Republican side, everybody, a lot of people want to make fun of Donald Trump because of the things he says, he's controversial, all those kind of things, but he's found a way to tap into this anger that people have, that they look at Washington, D.C., and Democrats and Republicans both, and they're not getting enough stuff done. They don't work together, all they do is fight, they just work to get reelected. They're just not serving their country and the people of this country the way they're supposed to. So to me, that's sort of the backdrop of what we have going on in this current caucus cycle. And so we have, now it looks like Hillary Clinton maybe maybe she's already done this, but pulling ahead of Sanders right now, and Sanders is going to have to figure out how to kind of come back and sort of build this revolution he's trying to build. On the Republican side, it's all these outsiders with Ben Carson and Donald Trump that have tapped into this angst and this anger that we have out there, which I think makes this caucus cycle feel different than before. Um, I wrote a book about the 2012 cycle thinking that that was unique because it was, at the time, it seemed like it was kind of chaotic, and so we made Caucus Chaos the name of the book, thinking, okay, it's going to be chaotic, probably won't see that again. Democrats were easy to figure out because Barack Obama was the in incumbent president. He was running for re-election, so we didn't really have much of a caucus effort, obviously, on that side. And the Republican one was crazy. Almost everybody who ran was a front runner at some point. Anybody remember Herman Cain? I mean, there are a lot of names that almost 
are going to be just little footnotes in history, but Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, all these folks got their time in the sun there, their 15 minutes of fame, then they kind of disappeared for various reasons. But the underlying current of all of that was, I think, showcased this state and the caucus process. You had a man who used to be a senator in Pennsylvania, Rick Santorum, who almost nobody knew, and I can promise you he would have done cartwheels, whatever you want to say, to see a crowd this big for 90% of his campaign because he would have been happy with this crowd right here. He could net, that man could not fill a room. I mean, nobody knew who he was. He just wasn't, a, you know, everybody was attracted to all these other candidates. But Santorum persevered, and that's what the caucus system can be all about. If you're, it forces you to get out there and talk to people, share your ideas, meet face to face, and that doesn't work for some candidates. Like Rudy Giuliani, when he ran in 2008, it's not his deal. He kind of came in here as a celebrity, gave speeches, and took off. Some people would say that's what Hillary Clinton did a little bit in 08, and she doesn't do that at all this time. She really comes in and works the room, does more town hall meetings. When the thing's done, she comes and shakes hands and talks to people. They've made a huge 180 switch now that she's running the second time versus the first time. And the caucus process forces you to do that because people are almost spoiled to it. I mean, they expect to meet these people face to face and get to talk to them and share their ideas. To me, as an observer who didn't grow up here, that is what I think is the coolest thing, is that you have a chance to actually ask the next president of the United States a question. Maybe you plant an idea in their head that they had never thought of before. Maybe it's just highlighting an issue. Maybe it's your personal story, whatever it is. I just think that is something that you can't get at almost any other place across the country. So I mentioned Rick Santorum. That's why I think 2012 will have a big effect on 2016 in the sense that if you look at the Republican candidates, there are like a million of them. So I think we're down to 15 if you count everybody who's still in there. And you look at it and think, okay, if I'm running for president and I'm getting 1% or 0% in the polls, I'm going to quit, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is annoying because it's too many to cover. But it's because of Rick Santorum in a lot of ways, I think, because they look at what he did back in 2012, and he didn't have any popularity. Frankly, he doesn't have any now either. But if he would have quit, he would have never been the runner-up. And basically, he was the runner-up in the process. He eventually won the caucuses here and then survived for a while longer, and Romney beat him in the end. But I think that the caucuses show that if you stick with it and you keep working it, and that's what some of these candidates are doing, and they look at 2012, at what Rick Santorum did, thinking, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. And that's not why they're not willing to quit. I can guarantee that for the reporters who are trying to follow these people all over the place, selfishly, we wish the Republican field looked like the Democratic field and only had three people because it would be a lot easier to cover. Uh, that and super PACs that can keep some of these campaigns alive by throwing these big dollar donors so that they can pay for hosting events like this or putting up TV ads, those kind of things. I think that will keep this kind of going and going, but a lot of, I think, what we're seeing now is based on what we saw in 2012. Uh, he wanted to know, since we're first in the nation, usually we have all these fights, and this time around we didn't really have the same kind of fight, and that's because they changed the rules a little bit, the way they divvy up the delegates and that kind of thing, and they really punished the states who try to jump before us. I think we're probably safer right now than we have been for a little while, but I think, it, as always, it depends who wins. And if it's somebody who doesn't really like the caucus process, are they really going to fight to protect it in 2020? The Republican, the Republican national chairman casts some doubt about whether we should feel safe and secure that we're going to stay number one. But, you know, it, I, I wonder what will happen if Democrats win and Iowa Republicans pick the wrong candidate. You know, the winner of the Republican caucus is not the eventual nominee. I mean, that that will probably further inflame that argument that we don't pick the right people here. So I, I would assume we'll probably have the same fight. I just felt like this cycle we probably didn't have it as much because they proactively changed some of the rules to protect against that. But obviously it's, you know, it's a, it brings so much prestige and money and attention and everything to this state that would go away if we're not first anymore. Not if we want to be first, because that was the agreement with New Hampshire that they work that out, that we do caucus, they do primary. That's where it gets a little tricky with some of the things Democrats are trying to do to get more people to take part in the caucus. You know, they've talked about absentee 
whether it's um, for the military or maybe it's at your work site or whatever they whatever it is, or if you just have to work that night, can't get in, you know, they're trying to look at how do you get more people to take part in the process, but that's the danger that the critics would say is that the more you do that, the more it resembles a primary. And the agreement we have in, with New Hampshire right now is we both can't have primaries. So that's how we stay first. So if we uh, get rid of the caucus system, we're, pr we're not gonna be first anymore, it doesn't look like. All right, so next up, we're gonna learn a little bit about the Republican and Democratic processes. Uh, our next speaker is Kim Ream. She brings 28 years of grassroots political experience to her clients of her company, Ream Consulting. Ms. Ream has successfully managed state house, local, and ballot issue campaigns, and she provides key assistance to political clients. Uh, she has particularly enjoyed working for two speakers of the Iowa House, uh, both from Lynn County, and is working with Speaker Select Linda Upmeyer. Uh, Kim is also the 2014-15 president of the Iowa Federation of Republican Women, and she is the fourth vice president-elect for the National Federation of Republican Women. So we'll hand it over to Kim to talk to you about the Republican process. They told me to make it fun, and I just thought, but it's kind of like watching paint dry. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, let's talk about a caucus first of all. Uh, notice a lot of you, I couldn't see when Dave was asking, how many of you said you've been to a caucus before? And how many of this will be your first time? Good for you, good for you. I remember going to my first caucus in junior high and my mother was very intimidated by the process. She left thinking that was way too much. I didn't, way out of my comfort zone and my dad was like, hey, I got all those people to listen to all the far out things I had to say. So anyway, um, they came away with very different opinions of the caucus process. Well, I like caucuses because they are grassroots politics at its, at its finest. It's never going to get closer to your house than your precinct caucus, closer to where you live, closer to the people that you know than when you're sitting down with your friends and neighbors, rolling up your sleeves and talking about things that you agree on or maybe slightly disagree, but you think should shape the party. So that's the opportunity we have with the caucus process. Now, when you go to caucus, to the Republican caucus, um, registration is the key. Um, you have to be a registered voter, and you can be um, a registered Republican, check in, you know everything will be just fine, but you do have to be a registered Republican to participate in the Republican caucus process. So if you are unaffiliated or with another party, you may change your registration at the door, but you do have to register as a Republican to come in and participate in the process. If you are not a registered voter, not to worry, just as we have same day uh, voting, at the polls, um, you are able to register at the caucus, same day. So, but it's incumbent upon you to tell us who you are, you need to prove who you are and where you live. The best piece of identification that you could bring to do this would be your Iowa driver's license with a current address on it. There's lots of other forms of documentation that you can bring, but I'll let you go to the Secretary of State's website and find those. So identification is key. So the next thing is your caucus will start at 7 o'clock. We try to be very prompt about that because we've got a lot to do. You might have noticed we have those 15 candidates running. In a minute, you're going to do the math and think we'll be there all night. Um, we're going to have a welcome by our temporary chair, and we'll go through the Pledge of Allegiance. And the temporary chair will read our purpose statement, which in a presidential year, we have five items of business. We're going to conduct a straw poll. We're going to elect precinct representatives to our county central committee. We're going to elect delegates and alternates and junior delegates to our county convention. And we're going to elect precinct representatives to any committees for county convention. And we're going to discuss and dismiss, uh, submit platform issues for our county convention. So he, will read, he or she will read our statement of purpose. And then uh, the all important, you know, like anybody go to church, do they let you out without taking the offering? Do they ever hold it in front of you till you put something in? <laughs> well, um, we passed the Lincoln bag, and that's just because there's some inherent costs with holding the caucuses. Most of the buildings either give us a very reasonable rate or charge a slight fee, and mostly if they charge, it's for cleanup or setup, things like that. But the, the Lincoln bag or the buck bag is your opportunity to help uh, defray a few of the costs. So let's get started here. Um, before we can do our official business, we need to have that uh, temporary chair and temporary secretary made permanent positions. So 
the permanent caucus chair's job is to conduct the business of the caucus in an impartial manner, and they are just elected by a plurality. So just whoever the nominees are, whoever gets the most votes, they become the permanent chair. Same with the secretary, but the secretary's job is to record the results of the caucus on all the appropriate forms and hopefully get the right information <laughs> when it comes down to who won that presidential straw poll, get it turned in uh, correctly. We saw the downside of that a couple years ago, four years ago. Okay, the presidential poll, um, each candidate's rep gets three to five minutes to speak. I think in my county they agree on three minutes, and so if someone gets up to speak in favor of someone, it only takes a minute, someone else will be like, we got two minutes left, we got two minutes left, you know, and so any number of folks can fill the three to five minutes. The order of the speakers is alphabetical by the campaign, by the candidates, by their last names. So in our case, this year, uh, as things stand, uh, Governor Bush's folks would speak first and Mr. Trump's folks would speak last. So it's alphabetical by the candidate's last name. When the speakers are finished, uh, we, we send around ballots, collect them, count them. One representative from each campaign can oversee the counting just so there's no monkey business. We're, we're, we worry about things like that. And then the results are immediately entered on Form E. That doesn't mean anything to you, but there's all kinds of forms and paperwork that goes with the caucus. Um, they're entered by the secretary, and then once it's on to Form E, this is where we're having a, a new step here, but uh, Microsoft has worked with the Democrat Party and the Republican Party to create an app. How cool is that? We now have a caucus reporting app. And so as soon as we have it written down, they will use the app to transmit the data over to uh, the state parties. So, um, you know, we are first in the nation, as Dave said, and we, it is incumbent upon us to get this right this time. We don't want a repeat of some of the stuff from 2012, where we changed our winner overnight. Okay, um, but you know, when I went to my precinct caucus in 2012, there were nearly oh, three to 400 people there. We were in a church gymnasium down the street. It was shoulder to shoulder, standing room only. All the chairs were taken. People were very interested. And when I went to my precinct caucus in the midterm election in 2014, it was myself and my friend Brenda. There were two of us there. So it, it, this presidential straw poll is powerful in getting people out to the caucus. But unfortunately, when it's over and the winner's announced, most people get up and leave. And that's why I say, wait, there's more. More exciting and fun things that go on. Um, the next thing that we do is we're gonna elect precinct committee members. Now unless, uh, well the county that I live in, for example, has amended their constitution, we elect four people per precinct, but most across the state elect two, and those people represent the precinct at the county central committee meetings for two years, so it's a biennium, it's a term of two years that you're elected to your county central committee and there actually is work involved. Imagine that. Um, my county central committee meets the, the third uh, Tuesday of every month and probably for an hour and a half, two hours if we're lucky, and, but I'm expected to be there and participate. So as, as a precinct uh, central committee member. Here again, plurality is the key. Um, However many people are nominated, the top two vote getters will go on to be the precinct committee members. <clears throat> the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna elect the county convention delegates, alternates, and junior delegates. Now, the delegates represent the precinct at the county convention, and it's important, you'll never be a national delegate. Don't, don't the national conventions always look fun? Well, you'll never be a national convention delegate if you don't, it's called caucus to convention process on purpose. So you have to start at your caucus, work to the county, work to the district, work to the state, and then run at the state to try to be a national delegate. But it's important, if you wanna ever be that person, you gotta start here. Our alternates are people who are on call to replace delegates if they're not able to fulfill their responsibility, can't attend, have to leave early that day, things like that. And then the junior delegates attend more of as a learning process. These are your junior high and high school students who wanna come and they break out, do their own uh, platform building, bring it back to the committee at the end of the day and let us know what important things they've worked on. I remember one year it was hot lunches. 
They didn't like what they were being served at school. So they passed a resolution to fix it. But it, it can come from anywhere, and you know, it's a great way to get them involved and let them participate in it too. The last thing that we do at our caucus is discuss platform resolutions. And this is where our, our party platforms come from. It starts here at the, at the caucus. So people bring their resolutions in writing, and it's incumbent upon the person submitting a resolution to put it in writing. Um, it's helpful if you actually just print it off from your computer, because I've, I've sat there reading those planks, you know, when they get to the county level, and it's like, I have no idea what this says. We'll just make it up as we go. But, um, they can be handwritten. We've had them on scripts of, uh, scraps of paper. We've had them, you know, written in a nice way, you know, printed out professionally. However you bring them, that's fine. But the resolutions are going to be uh, presented before you leave at your caucus. And if you want to move it from your precinct to the county level, then you have to get it passed by your, your local friends and neighbors who, whom you're meeting with. So. Once a, a resolution has been submitted and proposed, then the chair has some latitude to uh, encourage discussion. Um, again, go back to the fact that the chair is to remain impartial. So, you know, as long as with each issue, you know, he, he or she allows the same number of people for, the same number of people against, the same amount of time, there's some discretion that the chair has. But um, once we've had our for and against speakers, then the caucus will actually vote on each individual resolution, and a simple majority is needed to move them. So you gotta have the 50% plus one to get it from your county, or from your precinct caucus to the county level. And from the county level, they look at them and they start it all over again. <laughs> they go through every single individual plank and figure out what that county platform is gonna be. They move them forward to district and they do it all over. It just keeps happening over and over again. Keep refining it and pushing it forward. So, simple majority is 50 plus one. If you uh, survive through that, then it's time to adjourn and uh, you're able to leave and go home. But I would encourage you a couple things. One is be early. What if you're at the wrong precinct? What if you're not registered but you thought you were? Some of these things can hold you up a little bit and you know, if you're in the wrong place and you gotta travel a little bit to get where you should be, you might miss out on it altogether and that'd be too bad. Um, I would say plan, <coughs> plan like an hour and a half to two hours. It might not take you that long, but if you're a Republican this year, you got 15 candidates and you're gonna allow five minutes to speak, do the math on that. <coughs> you're gonna have just an hour of people speaking about their candidates before you even get to vote. So it's very different than going in in a primary situation. You might wait in line, but you get to go at a time that's convenient for you, right? You go at a time that's convenient for you, you wait a little bit, it doesn't really matter. You go in, you, you uh, fill out your ballot, put it in a machine, and out the door you go. And a caucus is just not like that. It's a meeting. And you're going to sit there with your neighbors and the people that live in your community, and you're gonna figure out what works best for your value system, for your belief system, and where you'd like to see the party go. So with that said, I'd just like to say thanks for having us here, and we look forward to taking those of you who are interested through our Republican Mock Caucus. All right, so now we're going to learn a little bit about the democratic process, uh, and then after this, we'll split up into groups to do the mock caucuses. Uh, so we have Dr. Andy McGuire here to uh, discuss the democratic, pro uh, democratic process. Uh, she's been an active Democrat for decades and has spent her career in the field of health care. Most recently, McGuire served as president of Meridian Health. She was elected chair of the Iowa Democratic Party in January of 2015. Uh, and in March, she stepped down as president of Meridian Health to devote herself full-time to the Iowa Democratic Party. McGuire will oversee the 2016 First in the Nation caucuses, as well as the efforts of Iowa Democrats in the 2016 general election. So I will turn over now to Dr. McGuire. This is a great crowd. I'm, I'm just so happy. I, one of the reasons I'm involved in politics is because I think we all should take part in it and make it part of our lives. And so it's just great to see you all here to, to do that. Um, I want to thank the um, Carrie Catman Chat Center and, and 
just, they've always, uh, because I'm a woman in politics, they've always supported that and given us lots of good information, which I think that's really important. Um, again, I'm glad to see you all here. Young people especially, that's one of our key people that we want out in the Democratic Caucus. Um, and what I will tell you, the First in the Nation Caucus is a very serious thing for us in Iowa because we take it very seriously because it's a very big responsibility. And I will tell you, it is one thing where the Democrats and the Republicans absolutely agree with each other and maybe the only thing we agree with each other on. But it is absolutely something we agree on because without, um, I don't know if you know how it works, but if the Democrats would do something that would lose the caucus, the Republicans lose the caucus. And if the Republicans would do something the same, we lose the caucus. So it's something we, we work on together. We've even worked on reporting systems together and that sort of thing to, to try to make it better for everyone. And we both want more participation. So it is one area where we agree. I will tell you that ours is more fun. <laughs> oh, it's a lot more fun. Everyone even, even will say that. And when you get to the mock caucuses, you can go either way you want. I don't want to bias you. But Ours is a lot more fun. Um, so I want to introduce our um, caucus director, who's really going to talk about the nuts and bolts. But again, um, and that's Josie Bradley. But, but again, I want to really tell you that I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're interested. And if there's anything I can do to get you more interested, or if you want to do more than just caucus, you want to run, uh, you want to help, those kind of things, you want to volunteer, we would love to have you. And I, again, just applaud you for being here and, and your interest. Thank you. Josie? All right, great. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for having us here. Um, I'm Josie Bradley. I'm the caucus director uh, with the Iowa Democratic Party. Um, I've been working in this role um, since March, uh, but I've actually been with the party working here in Iowa for about two years now. Um, and uh, the job of, of running the caucuses, it's, it's a big job, uh, but it is such an honor to be part of this program. Um, you know, here in Iowa with first in the nation status, uh, you really do have the opportunity to talk to all of the candidates firsthand, uh, to hear what they have to say, to uh, encourage them to listen to the issues that are important to you. Um, and in addition to that, um, participating in the caucuses gives you that same opportunity on caucus night on February 1st. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that process looks like, and then we'll do um, a mock caucus, mockus as we like to refer to it. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, some of it is a little bit similar to how Republicans will operate uh, the caucuses as well, uh, but not once we actually get into formation of what we call formation of preference groups. Um, so we, we similarly have a, a registration process. Uh, doors will open at 6.30, uh, probably a little bit earlier in some of the, the bigger counties. Um, and again, you do have to be in line by 7 o'clock p.m. We usually start right around there. Uh, so uh, I would also encourage folks to make sure they're, they're getting there early uh, so that if you're in the wrong place or um, you know, anything like that, uh, you have an opportunity to, to get where you need to be. Um, you do have to be a registered Democrat to participate in the Democratic caucuses. Um, you can register to vote at the door, uh, and party registration is also available. So if you're an independent and, and want to be a Democrat, uh, you do have the opportunity to do that at the door. Um, I would encourage you uh, to go ahead and take care of that early. I know there's an opportunity to do that here tonight. Uh, that way, um, you know, it just kind of makes things move a little bit uh, more quickly. Um, so the, the caucus is called to order at uh, about 7 o'clock p.m. Um, we do elect a, a permanent chair and a permanent secretary to oversee that process. Um, and the first thing that happens is there's usually a presentation uh, from the Iowa Democratic Party, uh, just an opportunity to, to welcome everyone, say hello, talk about um, some of the local candidates that we have running, um, and just a, a few different uh, elements from the party. Um, after that, we actually move into, again, what we call uh, presidential preference. So we do things a little bit differently. There's not a circle, a name on a piece of paper. Um, and the first part of that is, is calculating viability. So uh, what that means is um, a candidate uh, has to have a certain number of people on their side of the room or in their group, in their corner, um, to be eligible to elect delegates on caucus night to the county convention. So the first thing uh, that will happen, the permanent chair will count all of the eligible attendees in the room and announce that number to the group. And then based on that number, we determine what's called the viability threshold. And that's, again, a minimum number of participants you need in your group to be viable. 
or to elect any delegates. Um, mostly that's around 15%. It varies depending on uh, the number of delegates your precinct represents. Um, for our Marcus purposes, we'll probably go with that 15% threshold, uh, but we'll do that a little bit later on. So once that number is calculated, it's announced to everyone in the room, so everyone is very clear, I need exactly this many people on my side to be considered viable. So this, this is when kind of the horse trading starts and everyone starts moving around and trying to convince you to come over here and uh, movement. Um, we move into what's called our first alignment process. Um, and that's an up to 30 minute process where everyone's running around and, and moving to uh, show their support for a certain candidate or if they can be uncommitted if that's the case. So again, that's 30 minutes. That's really when members of your community have an opportunity to talk to you about why they're supporting the candidate they support uh, and where a lot of those, that grassroots movement and um, local uh, discussions will occur. So after those 30 minutes, each preference group will count their members and report that back to the permanent chair. Now, if they have more members than uh, that threshold that we talked about, they're considered viable. But if they don't, and they're non-viable, they have to be given an opportunity to realign. So then we'll move into our first realignment process. And at that point, again, you're trying to convince people from different groups to come over to your side. Having those conversations, uh, again, that grassroots element, and that's up to 30 minutes. So that's when you really see people moving around and trying to bring people over uh, and having those conversations. Um, so after that realignment process um, and you, you, know, you get to that point where all of your preference groups are viable, um, we then will report results. And again, we, we have our new reporting app, which is really exciting. Uh, working with Microsoft has been very exciting there. Um, and at that point, uh, we award the number of delegates to those preference groups proportionally. So uh, we'll break up the number of delegates the precinct has to elect depending on the number of members in each group. And again, that's done proportionally. Um, at that point, the delegates uh, and alternates will be elected. Each individual preference group gets to elect the number of delegates they've been awarded. Um, so there's a, a good opportunity to, to be able to move on to the county convention as a delegate. And then after that, we move back into some of our party building activities. Uh, you know, in addition to being an early bellwether state for presidential politics, uh, we really do see the caucuses as a party building activity. Um, so we'll also elect our uh, precinct committee people, the local representation um, of the Democratic Party in your precinct, responsible for uh, working with Democratic voters to turn them out in elections and caucuses, um, talk about the issues there. Um, and then we'll also move into a, a resolution discussion and adoption period. Um, anyone present, any eligible caucus attendee, uh, is able to, to introduce a platform resolution and talk about the issues that matter to them. Uh, people have an opportunity to, to vote to move those on to uh, the county platform committee uh, to be discussed possibly at the county convention and, and moved through that process. Um, so then there's an opportunity to kind of talk about any other new business that uh, the precinct or the county might have, and then the caucus is adjourned. So again, our process varies just uh, in the fact that we're forming those preference groups. There's a lot of direct action, um, direct negotiating on the ground um, as people kind of move from one side to the other, um, maybe from their first candidate to their second if it's not viable, um, and really just having those conversations locally. Um, so we're excited to show you what that process looks like. And thanks again for having us here. <laughs>